All right, I think we're about ready to get started. Um, quick show of hands, who here uh, uses SAS or Compass? Awesome, who uses like less, uh, any stylus fans? Okay, cool. Uh, who wants to use just CSS? Hopefully we'll not change your mind today necessarily, but uh, show you the benefits of why we like SAS. Or change your mind. Yeah, we're not here to berate anybody. Uh, and yada yada. Five. Yeah, there are free high fives to be yeah. had. So, uh, so don't feel like you have to get everything down uh, as far as taking notes. If you want to, you can download the slides now and follow along, or go ahead and you know download the slides and then go see a better talk. So and we'll have that link again at the end as well. So today we're going to talk about uh, SAS and Compass and Drupal. Uh, and when we say SAS and we say Compass, a lot of times we're using the two kind of interchangeably. Um, kind of like you might say like JavaScript when you're doing jQuery or vice versa. So hello, we like Drupal and SAS. Hope you will too, or at least give it a shot. Uh, I'm Nathan Smith. I do UX stuff at Project 202. Uh, it has a K instead of a C in the name, so you know it's cool. Uh, and I used to work with Matt at uh, HP Cloud, and so yeah. So I work at HP Cloud. Uh, use our cloud. It's awesome. Use their cloud. It's awesome. Oh, wait. It's in private beta. Use it when it's out of beta. Use it when it's out of beta. Yes. Or, or come see me and maybe we can do something. So uh, SAS and Compass were made possible by um, these three people and uh, a community of, of contributors. I just wanted to kind of put those faces up there to say that we our power users at best, but these are the we're not worthy guys that wrote all of SAS and Compass. Uh, so that just happened. I don't know if you guys saw. Anyways, I like to do kind of real-time presentations. Uh, that'll be the last mention of any of that. So part one, why SAS? Um, this is a, a key quote. Uh, this was related to other browsers such as uh, Firefox, potentially planning on adopting the WebKit vendor prefix because like everybody's only coding for WebKit. We're getting left out. So we should pretend we're WebKit to get included. Um, and the key takeaway here is this line here. A lot of people in Google say CSS is good for documents but not apps. And he says, no, nah, it's bad for pretty much everything. It kind of sucks all around. You don't have namespacing. You don't have you know, a lot of things that you would want from a more robust programming language. Um, so I mean, what, what can we do about CSS? Um, so we, from the show of hands at the beginning of the talk, you know, a lot of us have kind of dabbled in pre-processing CSS. Um, for those that are against it, I would put to you that we use dynamic languages every day to process HTML. And the PHP stands for PHP Hypertext Preprocessor. You know, if we're pre-processing HTML all the time, um, then why is CSS kind of a hands-off language? So I kind of think of SAS and CSS. Uh, this is a great uh, picture from a blog called thingsorganizedneatly.tumblr.com. Um, I love that they even took the dots off the bowl. Um, but basically, SAS allows you to keep things structured the way that you would uh, in CSS through at imports, but you don't because of all the extra HTTP requests that that would incur, whereas SAS munges them down into one nice file and minifies it for you. Uh, here's another quote from Jeff Croft. He is actually a, a Django guy, but he uses SAS, and his point was that nobody pre or nobody writes just HTML anymore, so we shouldn't impose that on ourselves for CSS. Matt, you want to talk a little bit about these GUIs? So yeah, so we've got different CSS preprocessors. In the beginning, I, I think we saw some hands for some less users, some SAS and Compass users, and Stylus and Nib. Has anybody ever heard of Nib? So it's sort of like Compass, uh, but for Stylus, and Stylus is the kind of a node in JavaScript Type deal for SAS. It's another CSS preprocessor, but for Node, um, on utility or other ways to get to it. Wow, that's awesome. We're styling the page. First, to use the wheel with your Wii controller snapped into it. Who's the double controllers, right? You know what I'm talking. About. For me, GUIs. Some people can beat Mario Kart using the wheel, and that feels like the GUI to me, where it's like, you know, like it's not a programming. You know, everybody kind of poo poos on HTML and CSS as being like. Oh, that's for designers. It's easy. It's it can't scale, you know. And then Compass adds like a little bit more panache to it. You know, he's got the the nice outfit going on. 
Anyways, so Compass is a open source CSS authoring framework. Um, here's a lot of lists of why things are good about it. Top one is experience cleaner markup without presentational classes, but I looked at, you know, when I was initially getting familiar with Drupal, I looked at the, the markup that came out and it was like class not logged in, class no sidebars, and I'm like, okay, I think I can, I can jive with that, you know, using classes where they're needed, not necessarily to exactly describe content. So I don't really care about the first point of why designers love Compass, but the rest uh, I pretty much buy into. So Compass is the secret sauce of SAS, and it extends the functionality of SAS by offering uh, a plugin architecture, so the way that you can have a jQuery plugin, it, it does that for SAS. Um, and you never have to type another brender, vendor prefix, which is awesome. Like, I, I can't tell you how many hours that's probably saved me. And I'm now supporting browsers I didn't even know I was supporting just because it, it does it for me. So I don't have to say, oh, I forgot to test in Opera. It just outputs that prefix for me. And as we said, we'll blur the lines using Compass and SAS kind of interchangeably today and hope you'll forgive us for the technicality. I mean, if we can call CSS HTML5, I think you can, you know, let that slide. <laughs> So basically, Compass is a SAS, like jQuery is a JavaScript, and that's a gross oversimplification, but that's a good way to think of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about how these are different and equivalent. So with SAS, you can have two different file types. There is SAS files and then SCSS files. And uh, SAS files, you notice, uh, you have indentation, you don't have semicolons, you don't have the, the brackets on the outside that we're used to with CSS. It looks a lot like Ruby, right, with your indentation, or, or Rails anyway. Uh, and then with SCSS files, it looks a lot like CSS, but you have some other things in there besides uh, your normal CSS, like you can see the include, some of the magic that happens. So there's kind of a difference in feel, and it's just I'm a designer-minded person and not like a Rubyist myself. When I first heard about it, I was like, oh, I'll probably love SCSS because I'm used to all the brackets. And then I realized, well, that's actually just unnecessary typing, so I, I started heading more towards SAS and ended up liking SAS better. And the way SAS works is it's all indentation based. So the next time you don't indent, it assumes that that's a new style selector. So here we've got dot gross with family of comic sans. And uh, if we had something below that flush left, then that would be another selector. Yeah, and I kind of came about it the same way you did. I was just too lazy to type all those extra characters. Yep. So um, everything we showed today will be in SAS just because that's our preferred syntax, but it works just as well for SCSS. So just imagine these extra curlies are there. Uh, so the danger of SAS versus SCSS is that there's the temptation to indent everything the way you would in the DOM. So if you have a table with a T body inside it, a TR, TD, and an A with a class of special link, you might be tempted to indent like this to keep it nice and clean, except your selectors become really, really strong and because the browser has to parse all that, it's got to go right to left and look, oh, I found a special link. Is it a is it an actual A tag? Yes. Is it in a TD? Is it in a TR? Is it in a T body? Is it in a table? Then if you ever want to override the, cla the color of just that special link in a particular context, you need to have that same amount of selectors to get down to it to match or beat the strength of that selector. So maybe that's something uh, someone here may not have known, is browsers parse CSS and classes and everything uh, right to left, not left to right. So it starts with that rightmost item and works its way left. So the, the, the least items you can have on the left is kind of a nice thing. So in these comments that are kind of hard to read, uh, it was basically saying maybe all you needed is special link color blue. You know, maybe you didn't in your CSS files. And I mean, even if you made a mix in yourself, there's different syntax for like moz is moz border radius top left, webkit border top left radius. There's no reason to remember all that junk because eventually it'll be standardized as probably to stick to. Uh, also, gradients, the stuff on the right is what you could type, I guess, if you wanted to. Uh, you can see at the top we've got experimental support for SVG is true, which will write as a SVG base64 encoded string. Uh, it'll write that to your CSS file. So if there's, and you probably won't, don't want to do this for every image, but if there's an image that's going to be on a site so consistently that it might as well be in the CSS file itself, you can do that with your gradients. And, and again, you can see here's the, all the fallbacks for the different uh, browser vendor prefixes. So here's a list of text editors and IDEs that support SAS and SCSS. Uh, our personal favorite, I guess, is Sublime Text. Sublime Text 2, yeah. Yeah. And if you don't use that, you're doing it wrong. No, just kidding. Um, but, you know, it's 
so this kind of answers the question of is it mainstream enough to, to care about or you know what what will my team say when I bring this back to them will they say that the text editor they use the IDE that they use doesn't support it chances are it probably does um, did I have in there twice these GUIs I don't think we talked about the GUIs yet oh all right sorry I made you talk about GUIs okay so these are GUIs so transplant what I said about Mario Kart to after this slide um, so anyways, these are apps that will uh, compile live your SAS files into CSS. So if you're not like a command line junkie who doesn't want to run like Compass Watch and some of the other command line utilities, these are just GUIs you can install and run and it'll take care of the heavy lifting. Some of these you can do things like point to a directory and say watch it. And when you modify your SAS or a CSS file, CSS files are generated instantly so you can reload the page. And Compass app, I think, is like seven dollars. Scout is free. It's Adobe Air based and runs on everything that runs Adobe Air. And then CodeKit is Mac only. It's probably the most elegant of all of them. And it also can do uh, CoffeeScript and Less and Stylus and all that. It can do CoffeeScript. I'm not saying use CoffeeScript, but it can do it. Um, but personally, we've found that um, workflow-wise, it's easier to replicate your process if you just use command line and have a text file that has all your configs saved that you can like source control or whatever. So my initial impression of SAS when I heard about it from friends that do a lot of Ruby is like, okay, cool, if I'm ever on a Rails project, tuck that away in my don't care file in my brain. Then it was like, oh, okay, so it's not just for Rails, it's for Ruby projects. Tuck that you know, in the other don't care file in my brain. <laughs> then I was like, wait, wait a second. You can use it in anything? Like you can have a flat HTML file that points to a CSS file that was compiled by SAS? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. And then now I've used SAS so much that when I'm in a project that uh, isn't Ruby based, I'm like, oh no, what if I want to use it and it's not in Ruby? And I thought maybe that wasn't possible. But then we did it in Drupal with everything else we have in Drupal. Yeah. host and say, I want to run Ruby on the host also, on that box also, so I can. Uh, so, but that modules, uh, they call some stuff and just include things your own SAS style add on. And it's all in PHP. So there is some potential there for maybe especially for themers. Oh, did I go too far? Nope. All right. Uh, and it requires a OP, which is a PHP port of Haml, um, but it's not really updated or used anymore. Uh, it needs right access to your theme. Now, if anybody knows this from a security standpoint, having your Drupal instance be able to rewrite part of your code base is not really good for security. It's not something you really want to do. Um, so don't that's just why. Select all and say 777 permissions? Yeah, yeah. You don't want stuff like that. So, you know. I'm a that's designer. I don't know if that's bad or not. It sounds perfect to me, right? Three exactly. Seven. Put that up on shared hosting. See what happens. But uh, so you don't want that. That's not good for. Uh, that. And despite its name, it didn't do SCSS files. It's hard coded to SAS files. Um, which for me isn't a problem, but for people who like to do SCSS files, that's a problem. Then there was the Compass style sheet tool module, Compass, right? Uh, it actually uses Ruby to do all the heavy lifting. So it pipes everything through to Ruby. You got to have Ruby on the system, it's got to be accessible. So it just kind of routes it through, and that's not too bad. Um, and it can, can, you know, you can tell, like, the Deval module, you can say, you know, refresh my theme on every page load, and it can regenerate those files only then versus other times. And that's not a bad thing. Um, though the one problem is, right, your compass location, it needs to know where that is cross environment. So if you develop manage that, if, and that can be a kind of a pain to manage. In addition to PHP is running uh, directory yeah, in, in your host, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then there, there, there's going the hard coded path. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, I'd say out of all the ones you looked at, that this was kind of our collective favorite. I think so. Oh, oh. Uh, it has some dependence the project to uh, do SAS in PHP. So where SAS is in Ruby normally, this takes the whole functionality. I'm aware of the backporting being done into PHP, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're porting the functionality from one language to another. The other language is always going to have a lag in time. Um, and then you use Drupal hooks to implement like namespaces to do all these different things. So rather than have a compass add-on, uh, and this is where you can get into things like having a five-star hook that people can call inside of their SAS files, um, and the five-star module could supply it in theory. That, that, that's the example that was given to me. But uh, uh, so compass and bootstrap and foundation, all these things that come with compass need to be re-implemented, entirely rewritten in PHP using our hook system. So right now, that's not done. It's, it's partially done. A lot of the really cool stuff that you can do in Compass isn't done. 
um, but a handful of things are. First, that might exist still over here because they're entirely different change, entirely different dependencies, entirely different management. Um, uh, and then, you know, you just put your SAS and SCSS files in your, your styles and it takes care of it and it stores the generated files in your public files folder. So this is an interesting idea and it's really being heavily pushed right now, but I don't know that it's something that I would want to latest bug fixes, the latest and greatest that comes with uh, the natural community of it. So, um, so I guess what we're trying to say is as in SAS with Drupal to try to click, uh, click, try to stick closer to the metal um, and kind of escape the not invented Drupal to Ruby if you had a Ruby server, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of us to port all the functionality of SAS and Compass from Ruby to PHP. Uh, SAS. SAS. So that, so that way, way I, I get down, down to one single HTTP request, request, request instead of what it would have been for, for my application CSS search, search system, system and system theme. I guess, I guess two, two because that would munch, munch all of Drupal's defaults together. together. So, so here's, so here's uh, an example, example of section, section in my info file, file that has the, the uh, CSS, CSS files, files in it. This was before, before I, I did a uh, uh, SAS, SAS approach. approach. So, so this is on document, document I hack, what, what Matt Clive calls it. I say, hey, hey, hey I want to reference CC tools to my AV, but I don't include CC tools, CSS, CSS files, files, so Drupal 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 I want to include that, that and then it never finds it, never puts it in there. Just stuff that I don't want to have to style over or fight, fight, you know, send a select out about it with module or Drupal native CSS files, so I learn here and here and just go away. I think more people call that that is yes, yes, actually actually directly call it FOAD for FOAD for those files. files. But you don't, but you don't you actually need the FOAD directory because you can, you can, you can, you can just, just reference, reference it after, after, after really, really using the one as long as it doesn't exist. It has the same name. It goes by. So really, really, really we take away all of those. This is what I had pre-SAS in my personal site site team. I had a folder called the code where I kept the actual files that I did have code that I didn't want to use. Um, so, so after, after adding SAS, SAS, if we ignore all the, the FOF and die, die files, files, we just have that one, one application CSS. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah you can even, even, even if I forgot to turn on. Uh, I still uh, think this is worth doing, 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 and we'll get to that in one second here. here. Um, so, so, so just watch, watch, say, I'll be out fast, I'll press, and that's going to minify everything. And even if you do that, that should still use your full source performance. Why? Well, let's flip to the next slide. Uh, the, the benefits, benefits of that, that are, are the cache busting, the cache busting, however you say it, uh, uh, changing this random alphabetic file, file, file name. name. So the, the next time the page loads, it'll find a new CSS file that's changed. changed. Uh, uh, if you have, have a style, style tag, tag that imports the file, file, older IE versions will treat that as if the CSS files off the footer, like a then go import your file. File thing for development. It was never really intended for production, for beating old IEs, limit on what you can do for development stuff. Yeah, so if so I it was really a, never intended for production. If I see a site that's like proudly powered by Drupal and I have tags with like 18 at imports, I'm like, oh, it makes me sad. So before I came here, because I'm a big performance person, I went and did a random sampling of uh, just sites of attendees. And about 50% of them don't have the pre processing enabled for CSS. So if you don't, you should turn that on. It's super easy to do. It's a checkbox. Just, you just go, um, well, this has the overlay, so yeah. you just click configuration and then in there, there's a performance link and you just say, yes, aggregate all this stuff. And production minified, I think that's from a module I have, but just make things as small as you can and munge them all together. So here's what it looks like um, with the compass output before Drupal has touched it. And this is what it looks like after. So here you can see clearly what's going on, right? Um, basically the only difference is that it's finding dot dot misc. So actually because I'm moving um, some of the system files into my theme directory to, to get that one HTTP request, I actually moved the misc folder and deleted everything that wasn't an image. So I have the misc folder with like the little loading spinner and stuff that Drupal adds in my theme so that it can do this, find it and then rewrite it to my, my um, theme path. So, yeah, you now need, you now know all you need to know. Uh, probably the best presentation you've ever heard at so far. I don't know. Yeah, me too. All right, best presentation cool. so, of the conference so far. Yeah, all right, cool. So, uh, oh wait, um, yeah, debugging, right? That's the one strong argument I've heard against SAS is, well, it turns all your parcels into one file, so how am I to know where my five pixel float bug is happening? Um, yeah, especially, you know, if it's all compressed down and you go to take a look at that. Um, Do you install Windows on here? 
I don't know what happened. So anyways, point being, <laughs> cryptic error messages are never helpful, right? Like a block that says your computer's busted, restart or something, you know? Because it's like, I can't look up this and then like, that's me as an end user, right? Um, so that's what SAS would do is compress everything down into one file as a human reading it. But this is no way to live as far as trying to debug things. Because it looks like it's smooth sailing. All right. Come on, so your stuff doesn't turn out right the first time? Uh, yeah. It yeah. does. This is for other people, this section. Oh, okay. <coughs> yeah. Um, so instead of having output style compressed, you want to say output style expanded. And then what that will give you is, oh man, it's kind of hard to read, but here it tells you line 102 on the reset under, uh, underscore reset.sass okay. file is where this chunk of code is coming from. So it tells so, you exactly where to look. Yeah, so if you inspect this in like Firebug or WebKit Inspector, it will show you exactly the file you need to go and edit to fix what's wrong. Sure. So it's, I, I always leave both of these lines in there, output style expanded. Output style compressed. Actually, you can remove output style expanded and just comment out output style compressed, and it will make it expanded by the nature of not having compressed passed. So then you don't even have to worry about editing anything above, like line nine. You just leave that all the same. Uh, these colon, they're a symbol, I believe. That's like a dollar variable name, you know. Um, it's easily the naysayers by saying you can get an easy stack trace of lines it came from. It's easier for files because in my CSS files I don't know what line something happened didn't necessarily, but uh, it's easy to find it in my SAS files. Mm -hmm. Things that normally would make it through to a CSS file, SAS catches ahead of time and says, "Hey, I'm, I'm not going to compile this because there's an error on line 15. You typed um, a semicolon and you didn't mean to, or you have a, two curly braces or whatever it might be. So it's a little more strict on the compile." Yeah. So when you screw up, it catches it. Um, so just, if you're going to go with SAS or Decision, because if another developer is editing the CSS file and committing that back to source control, and the next time you compile it just blows away his or her changes, uh, that's not going to... They won't be happy with you. Yeah. So um, I would recommend if you are going to source control your CSS file, you do the minified one. That way it's obvious to the person who opens it, like, I shouldn't, and I can't read this. This makes no sense. TextMate bombs out because it's a one-line file that's too long. Um, so yeah, so you just want to be tweaking your .sass files or your .css files. So let's show some demos. And I always think of, I always think of demos as like hit or miss, you know, like you got to pray to the demo gods and hope it all goes well. So we're doing offline demos today, so that won't happen. So any errors you see are entirely my own. So I'm waiting to see what explodes here, right? Because yeah. demos are always one of those scary things because it goes right when you're testing it, but then you get up on stage in front of a bunch of people. You got butterflies in your stomach and lunch is settling wrong. And so I aliased um, a few things in Z-Shell so I don't have to remember the deeply nested path to my theme. Uh, so here I'm going to say compass watch and open TextMate, or sorry, Sublime Text, recent projects. And here we can just kind of check out what's going on with my CSS file. So there it is, minified. Let's say I want to uh, check out what's going on and be able to actually read that junk. Then I can just comment that out, hit save. Um, let's say compass clean. And that will delete all my CSS, which is kind of scary until you realize CSS is the compiled result of your actual code you care about, which is your SAS files. And then if I come back here, you can see like um, all my stuff is readable. Uh, let me change my theme real quick. Uh, so here you can see here's all the Drupal default files. I have those listed first so that uh, some with the style that's more specific. You can see down where did that come from. I can go back and easily figure that out. Um, so that's pretty cool, being able to see that and then um, not have to wonder or, you know, just find and replace snippets or find snippets of text and search for them in a one, one line file. This is where the demo gods are going to 
strike by somehow making MAMP Pro not work. Wow, seriously? Okay. Oh, um, I did this redesign like two years ago maybe, so <coughs> forgive me for it not being like responsive and stuff. I hope you won't like hack my site in production or anything. So I just want to show you here where you would go to uh, the performance tab. Wow, really? Hmm. Just pulled down my database last night in the hotel room to make sure I had the latest stuff. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's really weird. It's after it does the processing, so you can see like it changes to the site's themes, all that. Uh, also wanted to show you guys, it's a project called GitServe. It's at gitserve.com. Um, it's another cool way to, to uh, play with SAS. If you, if you want to like mess around with SAS and like show it to people, but haven't gotten the okay to like throw it in a project yet, then you can, then you can play around with it with serve. So I just type serve, that gets my uh, uh, yes. Web server going, and then I can just go to localhost 4000. And this was a site I threw together for my sister's uh, wedding. Yeah, right, yay, good big brother. It's tough finding stuff you can show, I want you to show it or, so here I have my Sublime project. Uh, this is Haml, just, um, it's like shorthand for CSS, or I mean for HTML. Uh, and here you can see I've got uh, kind of the same thing, import, that type of thing. So I'm importing like a desktop file which imports a grid for desktop and so it's kind of cool like I use it as an excuse to like make her site like all uh, phone friendly for her friends on their phones and stuff. Um, what's cool about serve is if you just want to throw together a, a useful or just like a five to ten page site you want to have like navigation state that gets like class active and stuff, but you don't want to code that all yourself. Um, once things are to your liking, then you can say serve, export, so from where I'm at, then let's say go to like desktop deadbethany.com and that will actually write out all the files and so now everything is uh, flat file HTML and you can just upload that to any old server. Yeah, so if you've ever heard of anything like uh, Jekyll that's associated with GitHub, service does more cross-compiled languages. That's an easier. It does. I'll hack it a little bit. It'll do CoffeeScript. Um, geek, I couldn't. I'll be happy to do more demo code.